My name is Christine Munich. I am Soil Health Project Manager for NOFA Mass. This is Richard Robertson's No-Till Gardening for Homer Market workshop. Um, Richard began organic gardening over 40 years ago and became a serious farmer in 2004. He grows certified organic vegetables, small fruits, and Christmas trees at Hope Still Farm in Sherwin, Mass. Richard joined NOFA Mass not too long after beginning his farm and joined the Board of Directors in 2017. Before we jump in, I have a few details to review with you. First of our equity slides, NOFA Math Mass is strengthening our commitment to racial equity and justice by examining whiteness and dismantling systems of white supremacy that are part of many dominant systems, including our agriculture and food systems. We also want to honor the indigenous land stewards who are the original occupants of the land that we are currently living, farming and residing. Please use this link and find the area you farm and live and identify the original steward of those lands. Lastly, we want to call on everyone, especially white allies and co-conspirators to action on a few items to assist BIPOC-led organizations. Those actions are listed on this slide. Also, there are two events taking place for Spanish speakers and for BIPOC members. Please take a moment to review this slide. I want to thank our, set, our sponsors. We have a number, number of sponsors who help make our conference possible and I encourage you to purchase from them when you do and to let them know you appreciate their support for NOFA Mass. We've also got some incredible items to bid on in our online auction. Please visit the auction or text NOFA to 855-202-2100 to see the lineup. Please also take a moment to explore the virtual vendor marketplace where there is a lot of great information and some generous discount codes for conference attendees. Most importantly, we want to thank you. Thank you for spending the weekend with us and especially to our NOFA members who make our education and advocacy work possible. Thank you, and at this point, I will turn it over to Richard. Uh, thank you very much, Christine. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm looking forward to uh, talking with you all. Um, I, uh, I want to talk about how I uh, grow vegetables. Um, and it would be um, really interesting and helpful to me if I could start by uh, asking for a quick show of hands um, about uh, what you, um, how, how you grow. Uh, whether you're a, a primarily a home gardener, a homesteader, a commercial uh, commercial grower, market grower. Um, the, the easiest way I think to do this, um, if you go down to, I, I think it's on the, the bottom of your screen, there's a reactions button. It might just say raise hand, but if you have a reaction button within that, if you press raise hand, your hand will go up. And then after it goes up, if you press that same button, lower hand, it'll go off. So now, if I could ask, um, are there any uh, people who are involved in commercial vegetable farming on the call? Let's see, there's me, we've got a couple, great. Excellent, we'll leave it there. So we got uh, a good handful. Uh, so you guys can put your hands down. Um, are, there, um, are there people who are uh, currently gardening, I presume, who are interested in becoming commercial vegetable growers. Good, another, another good handful. Um, and then um, uh, uh, I'll just break it up with one more question. I assume that most of us here are gardeners at some scale. How many of you have a, a, a garden that is larger, as large as or larger than a thousand square feet? So that would be like, 20 by 50 or 30 by 30. Um, I expect we'll see a fair number of people. Um, there they are, there they are, oh, okay. All right, good. Um, it, everything that I talk about here, I think is applicable to every scale of gardening, certainly up to uh, serious market gardeners, um, but it's also all the way down to, um, you know, a, a, a hundred square foot garden. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen here, uh, if I can remember how to do that. There, I press that button there, and then let's turn on that one. 
and say share. And then I realize I'm on the wrong slide. So we'll go all the way up to the top and do that. And then do that. And then I think you can see my uh, beginning slide that says no-till gardening for home or market. I am Richard Robinson. I farm at a, a small farm in Sherborne, Massachusetts. Um, and I'm a member of the board. Sherborne is a, uh, one of the rural suburbs of Boston, about 20 miles west. I work mostly solo uh, and mostly full-time as a market farmer. We're certified organic here, about an acre and a half in vegetables, about two acres in Christmas trees, cashew and Christmas trees, and about five acres in hay. Uh, most of my time uh, is devoted to the uh, acre and a half in vegetables. Um, we use um, uh, two 30 by 48, rolling high tunnels, that's these things here, the hoop houses here, and they roll, if you're not familiar with that, uh, this one, whoops, what happened to it? This one right here would roll to this position once a year. This one would roll to this position once a year. Uh, and then we have one that's twice as big, uh, which stays put. Um, but what I wanna talk about today, in fact, is primarily outdoor gardening. And that happens in um, these fields over here, uh, five major outside gardens, one, two, three, four, five. You can see they're different sizes and slightly different shapes, but they average about uh, 70 by 100. <clears throat> and then we have a few smaller ones as well. Um, they're all uh, permanent beds, uh, four feet on center. Uh, uh, market gardeners typically lay out 30 inch beds with um, 18 inch paths. I have never found a 30 inch bed with an 18 inch path to be workable for me. So I lay them out in four foot centers and my growing areas, usually somewhere between 24 and 30. Um, and then I have wide paths because it just works out better. We do mostly no-till uh, trying to get everything there. And we'll talk about some of the challenges as well to, to doing that. I wanna give you a very, very quick overview. And if you have to leave the session, this slide will tell you everything that I'm about to tell you. Um, stop tilling, uh, increase your soil organic matter, bury your weed seeds with a thick layer of compost on your growing beds, mulch over the beds and paths with leaves, rake the leaves off in order to plant. And my experience has been, you can get virtually complete elimination of annual weeds, first lane, pigweed, lamb's quarters, and a phenomenal increase in soil fertility simply by following those steps. Um, this, we'll come back to slides that look like this, but this is what I'm talking about here. Here's a growing bed with some compost that I've dumped by wheelbarrow here, piled up some leaves here, uh, and then those leaves either stay there or we rake them back over the, over the field. A um, couple of you still have your hands up, and you're, if you have a question, I could answer it, but I, you may, it may just still be up from before, so um, leave them up and I'll get to you. Oh, there they go, great. Uh, but now uh, in outline then I wanna talk briefly about why no-till. I expect most of us have um, uh, explored that idea already, but I wanna just review that real quick. And then what I think is an important, really important question uh, for uh, gardeners of every scale, which is cover cropping and the challenges of cover cropping, cover cropping being a, uh, a major way that people think about doing no-till. I found it to be really hard, and I'll talk about why I think it's really hard. I'll talk about what I do instead, uh, primarily, which is a combination of leaves and compost. The successes I've, uh, I've uh, been finding, and then about sourcing and handling leaves, which is a, something that most people probably won't be familiar with. Uh, and then the challenges, because there are some challenges with growing this way. And then at the end, um, controlling quackgrass, and quackgrass is my nemesis. And I will talk you till I'm blue in the face about how to control quackgrass. And I still don't really know how to do it, but I have some ideas. So the problems with tilling are manifold. First of all, I, was, I would say, um, like everybody else, I really appreciate the, the austere beauty of a well-tilled field. It looks like a, uh, a, a clean slate. It looks like an empty canvas. It looks like there's so much that will grow up there. Unfortunately, much of what will grow up there, if you let it, will be weeds. And you do have to be 
a cognizant of that if you do decide to till that you're going to be churning up weed seeds. But there are more problems as well. Someone, and I, I wish I knew who said quite aptly, tilling is all the natural disasters at once. You're, you are causing a, uh, a little bit of a fire in the soil because all of that air that's incorporating is uh, giving oxygen for soil organisms to metabolize soil carbon and it burns it up. And you know, the, you hear different estimates, but you know, something like a loss of 1% of soil organic matter for every uh, tilling, uh, tilling event. It may not be quite that bad, but it's bad. You keep tilling and it's very, very hard to build up soil carbon. And so I'll talk in just the next slide, I think about uh, how important soil carbon is. You also destroy the soil structure. Soil over time develops a structure composed of aggregates that uh, it maintains channels for air and for water movement. As the, um, as the earthworms move through, they will open up those channels. And, um, and also um, mycorrhizae of, of fungus develop these really broad networks over time. Um, and tilling will destroy all those as well. The fungus will survive, they'll, they'll regrow them, but their benefits are lost uh, for, the, for the short term at least. And then you directly kill an awful lot of worms uh, when, you, when you till. Um, it is inevitable. We are, we are gardeners who will inevitably uh, have some effect on the, you know, on the soil biology, including worms. But the more you can leave them, the more work they will do for you. I consider myself a solo farmer, except for the mm, million worms that work for me. And I really like to make sure that they are uh, well fed and well cared for. And then the thing I really want to stress, which I think we all know, but, but maybe doesn't really get enough attention, which is that when you till, you're constantly bringing up fresh weed seeds. Um, it, it's a, it is a battle that you can't win uh, if you till, because those seeds are, are going to be coming to the surface where they really are, are going to want to sprout. Um, and no-till agriculture can help you solve all those problems. Two key concepts. One is soil organic matter, which again, I think this audience is really quite familiar with, but um, it's, it's really no, um, it's, it's no contest that it's, it is the foundation of soil health. Getting your organic matter up into the uh, six to 10% range, I think should be the goal of, of every gardener because wonderful, wonderful things happen when your organic matter is really high. Uh, your plants will be very, very healthy. It's not that you'll never have a problem with plants. That's not really the case, unfortunately. But your, your food will taste better. It'll be healthier. Um, and your plants will grow better. And, um, it's really the goal to shoot for. Standard agricultural practices deplete soil organic matter. Um, plowing, tilling, uh, uh, do that. Leaving your, your, your field bare will um, uh, begin to burn that up. And it, it's, a, it's a shocking fact, but it, serves, it is true that the current national average in agricultural soils is less than 2%. And if you consider what soil is and what you want it to be and what a 2% organic matter or less looks like, they're just so worlds apart. I really, really encourage you to get a soil test every once in a while if for no other reason to find out what your percent organic matter is, they help you stay on track to build it up. Um, Richard, um, if you don't mind me interrupting, we had a couple questions about jumping worms in the chat. No, just yeah. yeah. Um, um, so he was wondering- If I can, let me just say, I don't know anything about jumping worms and I would love to, to talk about them afterward, but all I can say right now is I don't know anything about them. But anyway, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, Amy was just wondering if they were bad um, or a problem. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think the general consensus is that they are, they are problematic. Um, and then also Courtney was wondering if leaves have been contributing to dumping worms as well, and if you are seeing them in your experiences. That's a really good question. I don't think they are. Um, I don't think leaves are, are a, a problem for uh, uh, promoting a jumping worm. Um, uh, but I, I really don't know. That is a good question. Uh, you know, this is a, a topic that all, you know, has been brought to all of our attention in the last uh, year or so. Um, and I'm a complete ignoramus about them. We can get back into that um, 
when we uh, when we uh, get toward the end too, because I do want to talk some more about worms. And also, and Richard, yes. sorry, sorry to interrupt, Richard, but we yep. so we are picking up a little bit of feedback from from your line. So I don't oh. know if you're able to to reposition yourself in relation to your microphone, or um, you know, it's not terrible, but it's it's present. Okay, let me um, let me do nothing for this slide, and then if it's still bad, I'll try to do something. Thank you. Then I was also wondering, um, Jay had asked a question about the definition of tilling. If you don't mind giving your definition for that as well, I think that might help help everyone. That's a really interesting question. Um, I would say there's no good definition. I would say that what I mean by tilling is um, using a tool or even just a shovel to disturb below say an inch and a half. I think most market gardeners think of the top inch and a half soil as extremely dynamic uh, at all times. And that's certainly true uh, in my gardens. I try not to disturb the soil. You know, I try to disturb as little as I can, but certainly the top half inch is constantly being sort of kicked around and, um, and even below that. I do think it's worth pointing out that by the time you get down to an inch and a half though, you are, uh, you are at a level that weed seeds can sprout from. Um, and so if you're gonna try to bury them, you wanna establish a level, and now I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but you wanna establish a level that is not gonna be disturbed. Uh, you wanna establish an inch and a half that's not gonna be disturbed. So that top inch and a half of your current soil uh, you want to go at least a couple inches above that. But I'll get back to that in a minute. Okay. Um, second key concept is the soil seed bank. There are an extraordinary number of seeds uh, uh, in your soil, in my soil, and they're very long lived. <clears throat> There's a couple of things here to point out. Some of the, the weeds we typically think about in the garden, lamb's quarters, purslane, pigweed. If you look at the number of seeds an individual plant will make. Uh, it's just phenomenal and it's scary and it kind of makes you want to just give up. And then if you go to the second chart, how long those will last in the soil if they're buried and out of the, uh, you know, out of the immediate uh, germination zone. Um, lamb's quarters, four decades, 40 years. When I started gardening, I had a lot of lamb's quarters. Those seeds are still out there waiting for me to turn them up, and that's scary. Um, pigweed, I, I underscored on both because it, does, it goes across to both, but also because if you look on the right, that photo on the right, this stuff over here is pigweed in my field. And it's just, it's absolutely the case. It's, there are just phenomenal number of seeds there. But, and I think this is really important, they have to be within the top couple of inches of soil to germinate. So if you bury them deeper than that, you won't see them. It's a cool thing. Paul, how are we doing on the acronym? Um, it's still, uh, still faint in the background, but we, you, you can still be heard. Okay, well, I'm, I'm gonna move a little bit, but I'll, I'll probably make it worse before I make it better. Um, so, um, I'm going to tell you how I do stuff, but I did want to talk about cover cropping, the other, the other no-till approach. And, and agriculturally speaking, certainly acre, acre per acre, it's absolutely the, the major way people do it. Well, acre per acre, the way people do it is with herbicides. But if you're going to skip herbicides, then, then the other common way to do it is cover cropping with termination. Very uh, typical thing to do is to, uh, during the fall, plant a combination of rye and vetch. Um, both will germinate well in the fall, grow on warm days over the winter, and then really take off in the spring. You can use oats and peas during the growing season, uh, which are, are not as cold hardy, not nearly as cold hardy. And, and people use more complex misses as well, but certainly uh, those two are the uh, two go-tos for, for most organic growers. Um, and then you have to terminate. Uh, you have to... Uh, uh, kill them down so that you can plant them. And on large acreages, that's done with heavy equipment. That, uh, that roller at the back of that tractor there is putting a lot of pressure on that rye 
to crimp it. And then if you do it at the right stage, then that crimping will kill that plant rather than um, it re-sprouting, it's done, it's dead. Um, and you, what you get out of it is a very thick layer of mulch, uh, which if it's rye will last a long time. And then of course the bench um, is um, giving you some nitrogen. For small scale growers though, um, this equipment is not really an option. Uh, and what people have started to do uh, is a, a hand scale, trying a hand scale version of that. Right here between these two people, there's a T-post. Each of them is holding a rope that holds that T-post and they're moving along maybe six inches at a time, stepping on that T-post and uh, trying to crimp that way. Um, and then, uh, most people's, I shouldn't say most people, certainly the, the problem is that the pressure that you need on that T-post is enormous in order to recreate what's going on with that, with that piece of machinery up there. And you don't really always get complete termination. I would say, in fact, probably most people who are doing this, almost everybody doing this, is following this with tarping, dragging a black piece of black plastic over it uh, for anywhere from 10 to 30 days. Um, you can also, there are lots of ways to get it down. You can also roll over it, human scale, um, which did not look like fun to me, but people were smiling when they got up. Um, I've done it myself with my BCS. Uh, BCS is a two wheel walking tractor. I have a, um, uh, a flail mower that goes on the front of it. I keep the PTO off of that flail mower so it's not chopping anything up, but it's got a nice roller on it and it just rolls, it pushes everything down and then I tarp it. And then I've asked myself recently, well, wait a minute, if I'm gonna be tarping it already, um, I, I'm not gonna be getting that crimping effect from rolling. Why don't I just cut it with my sickle bar cutter or with the scythe, get it on the ground that way, and then put the tarp over it. It's a lot easier than using a T-post, I'll tell you that, if you have the equipment to do it. My major point here, and then I'm gonna go on and talk about one more slide about uh, about um, cover crop termination is that if you're going to be doing cover cropping, and I do think there are some reasons to do it, if you're going to be doing cover cropping at our scale, I would think the major goal is get it on the ground and then tarp it. But cover cropping has some really Richard. Yep. Richard, I, I apologize for interrupting, but we are we're still getting some some um, distracting yeah. feedback, and I just want want to make sure folks are have the best audio. So. Um, yeah. I do have a suggestion for you. Yeah. Um, if you click on the arrow in the upper right of the mute unmute button. Sorry, hold on one second. I'm just going to go backwards so I don't lose my place. Upper right. In, in audio settings. Uh, there's an option for suppressing background noise. Maybe you can try that. And Richard, you are on mute now, so I don't know if you- Yes, I am. Mute. Sorry. I just put that on high and we'll see whether that helps. Um, okay, I'm going to go back a little ways on my thing here. Oh, I've, I've entered a bad loop here. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute and then start again because something's happened with my... Uh, okay. The sound is better, though. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. All right, hold on one second. I'm going to start sharing again. Go back here. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Can everybody see that? Should say the challenge of cover cropping requires long spring growth for maximum benefit. No, Richard, you're not screen sharing anymore. Uh, no, this is what I get for being. All right, try again. Share screen. Ah, I know, I did the wrong thing. Okay, now you can see. Okay. Um, so, uh, hoping this audio is better. Tell me again, Paul, if it's not. Um, 
challenge of cover cropping uh, is that it requires a really long spring growth for, for maximum planting date. And this is a really, really interesting study uh, done by uh, Natalie Lounsberg, uh, Lounsberg and colleagues at uh, the University of New Hampshire. Um, and I wanna go through it in some detail because especially for, uh, for market gardeners who have some acreage and are thinking about how they're gonna best use their acreage uh, for cover cropping, I think this study has really a lot to teach us. So what they did uh, was plant a, a really typical rye and vetch in the fall, 100 pounds of rye, 30 pounds of vetch per acre, the multiple plus, planted mid-September, and then looked in the spring at three different termination dates, uh, May 22nd, June 1st, and June 12th. In other words, they left the crop growing until May 22nd or June 1st or June 12th, and then they tarped it for three different uh, time periods and asked what were the benefits that, uh, that they saw in five different parameters, N for nitrogen uh, in the cover crop itself, uh, IN for inorganic nitrogen, how well that nitrogen translated into the soil, uh, M for how much mulch was remaining on the crop uh, after the, after the um, determination and a little bit of time after that, and then how much weed suppression do they get out of this treatment? And then how much biomass uh, was there? So um, jumping right to the, the best case scenario is this one down here uh, where they left it to June 12th, they tarped it for 30 days. And you can see you get the maximum of all five of those parameters. The colors don't mean anything we need to worry about at this point. But this was the maximum of all five parameters, was leaving it to June 12th and tarping it for 30 days. But I, as a market gardener, say, wait a minute. If I'm going to put some of my acreage into a cover crop that I plant in mid-September, and then I don't get to plant on until 30 days after June 12th, I'm talking about the middle of July for, before I can plant anything. Well, that's fall brassicas. That's too late for pumpkins or squash or something like that. About the only thing I can do at that point is plant my fall crops into that. And so however much land I put into that, I gotta wait that long. And then if you work backward a little bit, you know, you, you, if you wait to June 12th, well, you don't get the inorganic nitrogen, but maybe you can supplement with some nitrogen and you get the other ones. And, but June 12th is still really late for planting. And if you look, you know, if you go to this end, May 22nd, well, that's a good planning day for an awful lot of stuff, but there's very little benefit. And even then you're gonna wait 10 days. The point being that cover cropping is challenging. If you have the land to take a, a portion of it out of production for most of the year, it's a really good way to get a lot of biomass um, and a lot of good nitrogen without spending money on it. My experience has been though, I have really, I've moved away from that. Uh, I'm still playing with it um, and I'm still hoping to get better at it, but I've moved away from it. So that, and this is now the alternative, which is where we were going with this stuff and that is compost and mulch. Uh, I use a lot of compost and I use a lot of leaf mulch. The pros, a lot of biomass, a lot of weed suppression, a lot of mulch remaining, three of those five benefits. Um, no delay on termination. Uh, I put the compost down, I can plant the same day. Uh, no tarping. Um, the, it enriches the soil. It provides a lot of food for the worm. I stress this over and over because I think it, it's important that it's transformational. Buries your weed seeds and eliminates the germination of annual weeds. Over time, your soil will become utterly marvelous, and I do mean that. Um, and over time, I think it depends on the soil you have, but in, in, in already loose soil, you can put your broad fork away, you can hang up your home. It does have cons. Uh, it requires um, additional nitrogen, especially for early cover crops, because you're not going to be growing your own nitrogen. You're not getting cover crop roots to bring up the deeper nutrients uh, that cover crops can do, but you are, in fact, you know, your, your, uh, your cash crops can be doing that for you. Um, and then there's no benefit to pollinators. You know, this is a system that is not filling your field with uh, the way vetch will, will flower. 
and bring in pollinators or, or um, you know, one of the other flower and cover crops. And now, how do I do what I do? Comp hey, Richard, we're, we're, I, I apologize, but we are still getting a little bit of uh, feedback. Are, are you able to call in on your, on your phone to the, to the line, Richard? You can try that. I, let me step out for a few minutes, Paul. I just got to run and get my call. How about that? Okay. Ms. White, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. All right. We'll start again. Um, well, by the way, there's a question in the chat about um, moving leaves, and we're going to get to that in just a minute. Um, so uh, I was about to say uh, about compost, and you now have plenty of time to read this slide. Um, my major message is use as much as you can afford. Um, a a, a two-inch or three-inch layer of compost uh, my experience has been, will bury all of your annual weeds. It's not quite that you'll never see them again, but you will almost never see them again. It's, it is, I didn't believe it uh, a few years ago when someone told me about this, and I did it, and it's true. Um, and I say down at the bottom, thick is more important than rich. Um, you can pay a lot of money for compost, but I'm not sure that's all that necessary if this is what you're trying to do. And I would suggest, really, if you're interested in experimenting with this uh, to um, go for volume uh, and then um, use um, you know, some, uh, some uh, top dress nutrients to uh, make up for what uh, maybe you're not getting in compost quality. Because again, the point is to develop a layer that your weed seeds can't get through. Um, I listed three sources there just because uh, people might, people in eastern Massachusetts might be familiar with them. Western Nurseries is local around here, and it tends to be uh, fairly inexpensive. I use Smithfield Peat. They're in northern Rhode Island. Um, it's a very, very good product. I've used it for a few years now, and, and I, I'm very, very happy with it. And everybody knows Vermont Compost, and everybody probably knows Vermont Compost is probably about as good as you can get. Um, but it's really expensive, I think, unless maybe you live in Montpelier and you don't have to pay the shipping charges. Um, so you have some options there. Um, and um, again, if you start with a couple of inches, um, uh, that's, what I, that's what I would shoot for. Um, I would recommend don't start, if, you, if you're not gonna, if, if cost is an issue, as it probably is, certainly with all of us, don't start with a very thin layer of compost hoping that that's gonna do half the job. It's not, it's gonna feed your weeds. You have to do this in order to bury those weed seeds so that they're not gonna germinate. Um, you do have options with mulch. Um, I'm going to tell you why I think leaves are spectacular, but uh, people use straw, people use salt marche. Hay. Those people who use them, I think, no, they're very expensive. Um, straw has some you know, additional problems, uh, unless it's certified organic, and that is that it comes from commercial agriculture, and it is the, it is the residue of a, of a grain crop, and those grain crops may very well have been treated with herbicides, uh, in order to um, uh, to get them to grow uh, weed free, field hay. Um, I grow field hay. I sell field hay for mulch. I try to convince everybody who buys that field hay from me that they should switch to leaves. Um, it's very hard to ensure that that field hay will be weed free, seed free, um, because uh, farmers who grow hay are balancing. Uh, the problems of uh, weather and crop maturity, and the best time to cut hay for mulch purposes is in mid to late May, but it's not your your best uh, bulk. Um, uh, it's not the time that that the crop is bulked up too much, and so you know for that you cut it mid June, but by then some of your early species are already setting their seeds. Um, and it breaks down very quickly, unlike straw. Straw will last for a really long time uh, out in your fields. Um, field hay, not so much. So what's the alternative? Leaves. I call it nature's cover crop. Free, abundant, and seedless, except for the occasional acorn. You will see uh, a couple of trees come up in your field, but they're easy to pull up. And the worms love them. What types of leaves? How much? Uh, oak, maple, pine are certainly the major species that any of us would have available to us. There are others. Should you avoid walnut? Maybe. The real problem with, with black walnut is in the roots, um, the problem being that it secretes a, uh, an allelopathic toxin 
that keeps other plants from growing. Um, my understanding is that's not much in the uh, in the leaves. I have black walnuts growing on my property. I tend not to use them on my garden because it would mean I have to rake them up, and I try not to do that. Um, but I'm not sure there's any other reason to uh, to avoid walnut leaves. I could be wrong. Um, and then chestnuts, uh, Chinese chestnuts, horse chestnuts, American chestnuts have spiky seed coats. And if you collect the leaves or somebody collects them for you, you will get those spiky seed coats. It's like having lots of little sea urchins buried in your leaves. I stay away from them. Um, in terms of how long those those will last on your on your soil, pine will last the longest. Oak after that, maple will go very quickly. If you put down maple in the fall, uh, much of that will be gone by the end of the following summer. Uh, you'll have uh, half an inch or so. If you put down you know, four to six inches of maple, you'll have maybe half an inch left at the end of the summer. Your soil will be great, and I really encourage you to put down maple because it'll really improve your soil very quickly. Um, after you've done that a few times, uh, it, you may find that uh, it's going too quickly for you and you'd rather have some longer-lasting options. Pine needles, um, every, pine needles get a really bad rap, and I don't think they deserve it. Um, are they making your soil acidic? I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> I'll show you another slide in just a minute that, that um, uh, may lend some credence to that. Uh, but in any event, my, my general recommendation is almost anything you can get is going to be great. How much? Um, a landscaper's truck, they're, you know, they're all over the place, but if you think of that as being about a 10-yard truck, that's about a quarter ton of leaves, um, they're going to be chopped and compressed. They'll expand when they spread, when you spread them. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. In one of my gardens, about 80, 70, or 80 by 100 feet, I need about two landscape loads uh, to do a garden that size. So that translates both up and down. If you've got a 20 by 20 garden, a pickup truck full uh, will probably do you. But you'll find out. Once you start using them, you'll find out very, very quickly um, how you uh, how much you need. And if you're if you are, you know, if you have the room and you can stockpile them, um, you'll use them. Uh, and as they're waiting for you to use them, they'll turn into just the most unbelievably beautiful compost slowly over time. You're going to love it. Your plants will love it. There are nutrients uh, in leaves. I don't tend to uh, think of them too much in terms of their nutrient value, but it's absolutely there. I tend to think of them more as my soil conditioning value. Um, we don't need to go through the slide. The essential idea is there are some, but it varies very widely. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, just back to that question of pH, I haven't seen the fact, and this was a study from New Jersey uh, in which after three years they saw virtually no uh, effect on soil pH compared to unamended soils. As your soil organic matter goes up and up, it's uh, – it's very, very hard to make wide swings in pH, and it will settle into uh, a nice sort of 6.3 to 7 to 6.8 or something like that in that range. Um, um, I'm going to pause here just for a minute. Um, I'll give, this is sort of just recapping everything I've just said. Bury your reed seeds, spread the leaves, rake the leaves off the beds uh, so that you can plant them, use them for mulch. Um, and then pretty much you'll eliminate your annual weeds. If there are uh, other questions in the chat at this point, I'd be happy to take some, and then I want to go into how, to, how I handle leaves because I know that that's a, that's a, a big issue. Yes, thanks, Richard. So there's a question regarding um, any concern from herbicide from collecting leaves from treated lawns. That's an excellent question. Um, my, uh, my take on that is that... Um, People will put anything at all on their lawn and on their garden. And I, uh, as I say in the future slide, I don't take leaves, uh, I don't take um, grass clippings, I don't take garden clippings. But herbicides on trees, um, first of all, if you're using an herbicide in a tree, you're trying to kill it. Um, so it, it won't be providing you leaves. But pesticides on trees, almost nobody does that. Not to say that nobody does that, and I understand that that is, you know, potentially an issue. But um, in the volume that we're looking at, the, the, the price of spraying pesticides on um, 
you know, a, a, a small forest is just absolutely prohibitive. Um, so it, it really cuts down on that risk being a, a significant thing. I cannot tell you that there's no risk at all. Um, and um, beyond that, I, I probably can't. I probably shouldn't even comment because I, I just haven't got the, the, uh, the insight to, to talk about it. Um, and then someone else was wondering, um, should, is it okay if leaves are fresh or should they sit for a year? Oh, um, uh, fresh, uh, fresh is great. Uh, leaves have been sitting around composting for a year are great. Um, they will you know, do a fair amount of breakdown in the, in the pile. Uh, and so, you know, what you get is not quite the same thing as what you get when they're fresh. Um, but either one will work uh, really well. Um, do you have any thoughts on using horse manure mixed with leaves or compost? Oh, horse manure is a wonderful thing. Um, I, um, I actually have, have come into a really good source of horse manure. So ask me next year at this conference about using horse manure. Um, I do use it. I use it mostly on my hay field, but I am trying to work it into my garden so I can cut back on the amount of compost that I buy. Uh, because the horse manure is free, but I don't, I don't have a smart answer to that. I'm pretty sure the answer is uh, put it down in the fall, cover it with leaves, come back and plant it in the spring. Um, but I'm not, I can't guarantee you that that's the right answer. All right. And then we'll ask one more right now. Um, do you have, or what do you think of wood chips? Um, I like wood chips a lot, but I would not use wood chips with leaves for sure, because both of them are very, very high carbon, very low nitrogen. Um, I tend to like leaves a lot better because um, they are, um, I think they're better worm food, and I, I'm really trying to feed my worms. Um, wood chips might be better fungal food, um, but I don't really have a lot of experience using wood chips. Um, I use them on, on some of my smaller beds, but... Um, uh, I, I really like the results I get with leaves, and so I'm I'm not a, a wood chip expert. So I'll go on here a little bit, and then we can take some more questions. Um, uh, how do I plant? I rake the leaves into the paths. Um, if I put on a really thick layer of leaves, that can be a challenge, and it's one of the reasons that my beds are about two feet and my paths are about two feet, is I have to leave room for uh, for the leaves when I rake them in. I top dress with nitrogen, uh, usually feather meal, although there are other uh, good options. Um, and I say screen door thickness. I, I ask myself how much is enough, and people ask me how much is enough nitrogen to add. And I don't know the answer to that question. What I try for is to spread it so that if it were uniformly, perfectly spread, it would be as though there were a piece of window screen or door screen sitting on top of the soil. I could see the soil through it, but I'd have about that screen's worth of material on top of the soil. And that seems to be a good amount. I mean, I get good results. Um, could I use more? Maybe. Could I use less? Maybe not, because I think this is a system that it's going to make your plants grow really well, but in order to grow really well, they're going to need nitrogen, and the leaves are going to give you a little bit over a long period of time I think it's a good idea to add nitrogen. And I will tell you, in fact, the first year I really went whole hog into leaves, I had some really, really stumpy broccoli plants. And the reason was that they weren't getting enough nitrogen at the beginning of the soil, at the beginning of the season. They switched into hunker down mode and they never recovered. Um, so if you're, if you're gonna be doing this, I would say spend a little money on nitrogen. And thoroughly wet your compost. Um, compost, uh, this much compost all at once, um, will take a lot of water to really get it soaked. I like lawn sprinklers a lot. I just turn the sprinkler on for an hour, uh, and that seems to be a pretty good amount, or a good soaking rain. But a, uh, a hose over it for a minute is really probably not enough time uh, to really get that soil, um, to get that compost wet enough to really do the right job. Um, and then um, I have to move something here. As, as the plants grow, you can put the leaves back on the bed for mulch. And it, that works really well. I, I tend to sort of crawl down my row uh, and just by hand, just put them in. Um, and that works really well. I don't do that for everything. In fact, I don't even do it for most things. Um, but for things that um, you know are easy enough to do, or if, you know, say I'm picking beans, um, I, 
you know, just put a handful of, of leaves between the between the bean uh, the bean rows in the bed. Um, it, I've had some major successes. Onions. Um, I, I I would be I would be ashamed to show you my onions before I started this because by the time they were ready to 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 harvest, it was literally hard to find the onions. Um, with this method, the onions grow proud and tall. It's just wonderful. Garlic, I'll, I'll show you a slide on garlic. Um, you plant it, you forget it. Potatoes, a transformational. Um, and then it's it's really great for just about everything else. Um, it's probably not great for, I, I can guarantee you it's not great for um, uh, salad mixes, you know, something where you're going to be cutting a plant that's no more than an inch and a half or so, two inches high. Um, there'd be too much trash, uh, too much leaf trash in there. You won't get a clean product. Um, but I, I do use it for head lettuce. I do use it for um, uh, spinach because uh, I cut big spinach leaves. Just about everything else works really well. Uh, this is a, a look at my garlic. Uh, there you get a sense of, of the balance between um, width and, and beds. Um, a nice layer of, of mulch. The garlic I plant straight into that mulch and then, uh, sorry, straight into the compost, and then I just cover that with leaves. I don't uh, try to put the garlic below the soil. The garlic will come right up through the leaves, uh, emerge in the spring without any trouble at all. Uh, and then at harvest time, uh, I just yank them out, and they come right out. Every once in a while, you'll find one that's dug itself really down deep, and you might need a shovel to pull it out. But pretty much, they're going to pull right out by hand. Out of you know a thousand heads, I might have to dig two of them. Um, it's a really great way to grow garlic. I really, if you do nothing else, I would do it. I would do this for garlic. Um, uh, and then potatoes. Um, I I pretty much given up on potatoes, growing potatoes uh, before I stumbled on the system because I hated digging potatoes. I hated um, having to you know get in there with with a uh, fork and, and pull them up. In this in this way, I'll show you in just a minute how I dig potatoes. The seed potato goes right on top of the compost. I cover with an extra thick layer of leaves, eight to twelve inches, uh, and I almost. Pretty much forget them. I don't, I don't forget to, to go back and, and look for insects. I still get potato beetles, um, but I don't hill them for the most part. Um, you do have to watch, especially if you're using maple leaves, you have to watch for thinning layer of leaves late in the season because the um, as those leaves thin out, they can expose your, uh, your potatoes and then they'll turn green. But um, if, your leaf, uh, if your leaf layer is thick enough, um, you don't ever have to you never, ever have to hail them. And you've got uh, you know leaves in the paths as well, and so you're not going to get weeds coming up in there. And then at harvest time, um, I just I get down on my knees, I push the leaves aside, um, I wear a pair of gloves, and I dig out my potatoes by hand. And I'll show you what that looks like if this film rolls. This isn't a very good film, and I apologize for that, but I think you'll get at least a, a sense of what that's like. That kind of go there it goes. That's where the potatoes are. They're right at that leaf compost interface, uh, maybe an inch below. And you can find every single one of them just by digging around with your hands. And that's how I do it. Uh, it's um, I, I like working on my knees. If you don't like working on your knees, this probably is never a good system for you. Um, but uh, this is, to me, much better than you know standard planting the soil and hilling them up and then finding a tool to dig them up. Um, the yields are incredible. The, the, there's no bruising, um, unlike uh, digging with a shovel or with a fork or something like that. Almost every single potato is saleable, except for the ones that get wireworms, and that's a whole other problem, um, which isn't particular, I think, to uh, how you're growing them. Um, how do you how do I source leaves um, for home gardeners? Um, your yard, your neighbor yard, uh, or if your uh, you know if your yard is big if your garden is big enough to justify it, a call to a landscaper. For market gardeners, um, I used to collect bags of leaves. I uh, used to uh, take my pickup truck through the, the neighboring towns and pick up uh, you know a dozen bags at a time and collect a couple hundred over the course of the fall. Um, as I expanded, that did not that was no longer practical. Um, 
but and then I discovered how easy it was to avoid that, which is just call landscapers. They have to pay to um, to you know tipping fees to to get rid of their leaves uh, at places that make compost. Uh, and my experience has been that that they will call you once they know you're interested. They will call you and say, um, "Can we still come to your farm uh, this fall and and uh, and dump some leaves?" Um, you do have to be very firm with them. I tell them, uh, and I tell them every season, even though I've been working with the same guys for a while, nothing but leaves, no grass clippings ever. And if I saw grass clippings, I would say, thank you very much, but we have to end this relationship. No garden waste ever. Um, you do have to monitor trash. You know, these guys pick up uh, leaves with uh, giant suction vacs, and out in the yards where they're, where they're working, they're going to be kids' toys, which is the major thing that I find. Um, a lot of a lot of Nerf darts for some reason, um, and then um, you will find a little bit of, of uh, plastic trash, you know, some water bottles and stuff like that. But it's not bad, it, at least you know if you get the right if you get the right crew. Um, uh, you'll tell them where to where to where to dump it, and my advice is try to get it as absolutely as close to your growing, you know, to your gardens as you can. It's it's not hard to move leaves, but the amount that you want to be moving gets a little bit tedious if you're walking 100 feet from where the leaves are back to your garden. And it's really nice to save that 100 feet if you can. This is how I move leaves. Um, this is my wheelbarrow, uh, which I have kitted out with this uh, top. Um, and I use a three-pronged garden fork, and I load it by hand, and I walk it down my rows and dump it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this wheelbarrow, which I think is, and I've tried a, a fair number of different wheelbarrows. This is, and I, I never give, um, I never give shout outs to individual products, but I got it because I think this really is a better wheelbarrow. This is from Lowe's, big box store at Lowe's. Uh, it's the Blue Hawk. It's the bottom of their of their uh, uh, of their line. It costs about forty five or fifty bucks. It weighs nothing, and that's the key. It weighs nothing. Um, it, it Lasts really well. You see, I put down here a, a a piece of pipe insulation so that I can put my knee against there to push it around, and I I move it up and down the the rows, and it's just it's just a great tool. I load with this three prong garden fork. Um, I I tried others, but uh, if they're any closer together than the standard three prong, um, you'll be catching too many leaves; they won't slide off. Um, don't do this. This is how landscapers load their leaves. It is definitely not how anybody should try to move leaves from the pile they dump onto their garden. I thought it might be, so I bought one. Um, and I tried it, and it was a complete disaster, and I sold it within a week. Um, so I'll tell you more about it some other time. If you're interested, just let me know. But I really, really stay away from it. Uh, seasonal workflow is important, and, and one of the things that I think is is really valuable about the system is that, as I said, I'm I'm mostly a solo farmer, and all of the job of weeding during the summer is has to be done on top of all of the other things that have to happen during the summer, you know, planting and harvesting and and watering and you know markets and stuff like that. And one of the beauties of this system is that. If you're not weeding during the summer, you free up a lot of time, but the system does require labor, but that labor can be done in the off season. Um, late October, I, I try as much as I can to spread my compost on the beds that are now you know, harvested. And then as the leaves arrive in um, late, no, uh, sorry, late October, beginning of November through December, I spread them as much as I can when they arrive. I don't always, I, I don't always succeed. I, you know, there are some gardens that are going to have to wait till spring, but, um, it, the amount of work that you're going to be doing can be spread out into those cold months. Um, it's nice work, uh, you know, unless it's like today and I'm, I'm inside and everybody's inside, but, um, you know, on a day that's, that's 40 degrees outside, it's really pleasurable work. Uh, and it's, um, and you can do it, uh, all, all fall long. Not much less work than what you might put into weeding, um, but it is um, the, the results are much are, are really superior. Um, do I ever till? Yes, absolutely, I do. Um, when I'm breaking new ground, uh, which I, I I don't do that much anymore, but um, mm -hmm. I would use a tiller or what I really use is my BCS rotary plow. There are alternatives, and I encourage you to look into them: uh, cardboard and and um, 
and they were cardboard and bounce cardboard and, and uh, uh, compost, things like that. But I, I don't have experience with those, so I can't really advise you on them. I do row, I do till around my gardens to um, try to keep the quiet grass from pushing in from the sides. Um, and I do that a couple times a season. I should do it more often. Um, and also, um, sometimes, and it happened this fall, quiet grass, especially with all that rain that we got in July, it just really, really pushed the quiet grass deep into um, into gardens that I was trying to keep as no-till. Um, and I had to do some some uh, tilling to uh, to get rid of it. It's really, really hard to do quack grass control on your knees with a fork. I've done it. It only works for small areas. If you've got big areas, that's not really going to work very well for you. And as I say, if we if we do have a little time, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Where well, the challenge is blowing leaves are significant, kind of, not really. Um, when they're chopped, they mostly just stay put. Um, if you're getting leaves in bags, though, they will blow around a little bit more. On the other hand, once they get wet, they kind of stick to each other, uh, and you still don't see an awful lot of leaves moving around. If you are in a uh, you know an a, a upscale neighborhood where your neighbors are going to complain about leaves blowing in from your yard, it might be something to worry about. But if you're you know pretty much keep to yourself in your backyard or you've got a you know big piece of acreage. Blowing leaves is ju- it's just not a problem, unless of course they're going to grow on they're going to blow on something like your your flower gardens where you really have to worry about uh, or your or your um, uh, you know your your salad green uh, gardens where you really have to worry about um, stuff getting yeah. into them. Perennial weeds really are a problem, and it's a problem you have to to face. You know, they're a problem with with all kinds of things, but you know, rototiller tends to take better care of perennial weeds maybe than than no till does. Um, but um, it's it's primarily for laterally spreading weeds, quack grass, horse nettles, bindweed, um, uh, that kind of thing, where they're going to be coming in from the side. Um, weeds like dandelions or dock, which are are you know not going to be spreading by uh, laterally spreading roots, they're not hard. You you dig them out with a shovel. Dandelions have actually started to be able to pull out by hand. May depend a little bit on the soil uh, amount of soil and the moisture. Um, I would, I would, um, if you have a serious problem with with bindweed, uh, as I do in one spot on my farm, this is uh, it's a challenge. I've got to tell you, I don't know how to control bindweed, and that'd be a nice seminar sometime. If you have a serious problem with quack grass, I would say go for it because it makes quack grass control easier. Uh, horse nettles, same thing. Slugs and voles, yes, slugs and voles. These are the bane of the no-till grower's existence. Uh, slugs, uh, because all of that nice uh, stuff that you're going to be putting down the leaves and the compost will um, be perfect slug habitat. I think you can control them. I say, how many slugs are there? I don't really know, and I think it's an interesting question. I think you can control them by hand. Um, uh, I'm a sort of a fatalist about slugs, and I shouldn't be. I, I, I'm going to try this year to do a little bit better. Voles, I think you can keep them out of your garden if you mow a, a wide perimeter very, very tight. Just keep that down. And then I think uh, maybe even have a tilled perimeter after that because they, they really, really don't like to cross open ground, um, and that helps. You can use snap trays, and there's a recipe for a, a spray if you, uh, if you um, are really having a problem with them. Coming up, just a couple more slides. Uh, this everything you've just heard. Stop tilling. No till. Better for the planet. Better for the plant. Better for the gardener. I really encourage you to use the soil test to get your minerals right. Um, apply a deep compost and mulch. Top dress with nitrogen. Shoot for eight percent or more soil organic matter. What the limit is on that, I do not know. Ten percent seems to be great. I don't know where twelve percent would be, but there are certainly organic farms that have twelve percent organic matter are doing just great. Above that. I don't know. Um, I point out that both those minerals and that nitrogen are available through the NOFA bulk order, which I really encourage you to do. If you have questions, feel free to contact me. We can talk here for a little while, but happy to take uh, questions. The easy um, uh, email address is farm at hopestill.com. If you're not a member of NOFA Mass, please join. Um, and once again, bring bulk order for garden supplies, uh, ordered by January 31st. Um, that's it for me. I'd be happy to, to answer questions um, and then um, 
bid you farewell, but I'll, I'll stay on the line. Christine, back to you. Richard, thank you so much. This was a wonderful presentation and I'm glad that we got the audio worked out too. Um, we have a number of good questions in the chat. Um, there are some questions um, about weed. Jay was asking about um, nap weeds and multiflora that just seem to pop up. And there are also questions regarding how you um, can control quack grass um, in larger areas and scales. Yeah, um, I, I didn't quite get the first one, Christine. What was that? Sure. Um, Jay was wondering um, about control for, for nap weeds and multiflora and whether compost might help with those. And then also... Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I don't... For, for um, one, of the, one of the things that I am a little hesitant uh, with about uh, manure is uh, it won't have been... It won't have gone through the, the same rigorous heating process that certified organic compost does. And so I'm a little worried about the weed seeds that will come in. So that's why ask me, ask me later. Uh, um, if you're buying certified organic compost, you should not be seeing weed seeds in your compost. And if you are seeing weed seeds in your compost, you should be talking to your uh, compost supplier. Um, and if it doesn't clear up, you should be talking to their certifier. Um, so, so there are some there are some issues there. I probably don't have very good uh, answers for. And now I'm just going to scroll back and make sure I didn't miss the question. Um, as far as quack grass grows, I want to take just a couple more different questions, and then I'd be happy to talk about uh, quack grass. Um, uh, nap weed composting larger gardens will beat down nap weed. I don't know what nap weed is. I'm sorry to say. Um, those plants would like to rejuvenate in our fields that once were woods. Oh yeah, I I what I found is that the stuff that most wants to grow in this kind of a, a large garden uh, is dandelions, which you know do a pretty good job of, of getting themselves uh, down where they can down where they can sprout, um, dock, uh, and then the and then the creepers in from the side. I have not seen anything uh, that, you know, I, I assume I'm getting some bindweed, not bindweed, um, uh, bittersweet being dropped from, from bird droppings onto my gardens. I haven't seen any of that come up. I don't think it, I don't think it can get down through the leaves enough to really get up there. So let's take a couple more questions and then, and then I'll get to the question of quack grass, which I would love to talk about. Sure. Someone asked if you found if pine leaves or needles reduce germination of crops, possibly due to alleopathy. That's an excellent question, and I do not have uh, an answer to that question. I um, I do a mix of uh, direct seeding and transplanting into my uh, into my compost, and I have not found anything uh, except um, Oh God, the name's escaping. What do you plant in, in uh, parsnip? I've, I've not found anything except parsnip. I can't get to germinate reliably, and parsnip. Uh, some other time we can talk about how to how to get it to germinate. But um, but on the other hand, I I do a lot. You know, I do a lot of transplanting. So all my lettuce is transplanted. Um, uh, you know, so so I can't tell you whether whether we're getting an inhibition. I haven't seen any any pine needle specific effects where I said, huh, that's weird. I wonder what's going on. And then looking at, oh, I've got, you know, 15 feet of pine needles here. Maybe that's what's, maybe that's what's causing it. So I don't have much uh, experience there. Jay was wondering if you think your process might work for flowers with your, um, how you set up your, yeah. your leaves and your mulching. Yeah, I think, I think for, for growing flowers, uh, yes, I mean, my limited experience, but yes, absolutely. But I will tell you, uh, flower growers know that uh, slugs are the death of your market uh, in a way that they, they are less so for many of the vegetable crops we grow. Um, you get a slug up on your, on your sunflower and you can't sell it. So you really have to be careful there, and I would not encourage uh, flower growers to go wholesale into this system 
without foreseeing whether whether they're going to have a problem there. But as far as growing up the plants go, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And Kim was wondering if you have thoughts on alfalfa meal or soybean meal for nitrogen. Um, the way that I pick my nitrogen is uh, dollars per pound. Uh, I use the um, well, I shouldn't say that. Blood meal is very different than anything else. Blood meal is a very, very fast-release nitrogen, and, and it's in a class by itself, and you use it for uh, certain things. It's also very expensive, so it doesn't really figure in here. Um, for a number of years, though, I, I tended to pick feather meal because it was the cheapest per pound. It's very slow release compared to some of the seed meals like um, cottonseed meal or soybean meal uh, or alfalfa meal. Um, alfalfa, I guess, is leaves. It's not really seed meal. But those, the plant, the plant uh, nitrogen sources tend to be faster release than the than the feather meal. Um, but I have not found that to be a particularly terrible problem. Um, I, if I were using just feather meal, I would probably want to use. I, I have used a little bit of blood meal at the same time for the early brassicas. By the time you get to midsummer, there's enough nitrogen in the soil to, from the leaves even to get most things off the ground. Um, I will tell you, I, I, uh, on, on the recommendation of Laura Davis, who's uh, on the NOFA board as well, um, I started using a, a bagged nitrogen product, but now I've forgotten what it's called. Uh, oh, shoot, I forgot it. Anyway, it's in the NOFA bulk order. Uh, it's a 10 product, and it's a mix of different nitrogens, and it's really nice. Um, it's a mix. It's got some blood meal in it, but it's also got feathers and, and uh, some plant meal and stuff in it. It's, it's a good product. But anyway, I hope that answered the question. Thank you. And um, let's see, do we have any other specific questions before Richard starts getting into quackgrass control? And you're welcome to come off mute if you'd like to just ask them or you can put it in the chat. Okay. I'm going to um, I'm going to share my screen again just to show you a couple things about uh, quack grass. I hope this is it the right one. Yeah, let's try it out. Um, and I'll just uh, I'll go down here to. Oops. Oh, I guess you, can you can you see my? You can see my screen. I know, but I'm from, this isn't working quite the way I expected it to. Be. Let's try. That okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay. First of all, I, I just want to show you that, which is not quack grass, by the way. This is foxtail uh, grass, uh, which um, I I will confess is a serious problem for me um, when I if I don't if I don't pay attention. If you're not familiar with foxtail grass, it's a um, it's an annual grass. It uh, grows up quite innocently until it gets to be about uh, 10, 12, 16 inches tall, and then it puts out these um, uh, accessory adventitious roots. And once those start coming out, and it also, and this tends to become quite a woody base. And once those come out, it's almost impossible to pull out of the ground without really, really disturbing the soil. And I, I've had this problem for years. And this past summer, I said, I wonder if I could cut it. And so I took an old uh, woodworking saw, this is actually a Japanese pull saw, and just cut, cut down and just cut it off at soil level. And my gosh, it works great. This, it's just the most, it's the most spectacular tool for cutting off giant weeds. And that's a blue tarp I put next to it so that all those seeds, all those thousands of seeds, can fall onto the tarp, not onto the soil. Um, and I, uh, I spent some some time doing that works great for crabgrass as well. Uh, crabgrass doesn't get as woody, but it, you know it it just crabs out until it, the thing is like you know two or three feet wide, and you can just run the saw along the surface of the soil and cut them all without disturbing the soil, and that's really what I was after. You don't need a Japanese pull saw, although I got to say the ability to, to cut on the pull stroke rather than the push stroke uh, is a major benefit. So that's not quite grass. This is how I have been controlling quack grass. That's my BCS with a rotary plow on it. The rotary plow is a terrific tool, unlike a rototiller, which spins in the, uh, uh, I 
don't know how to describe it. You know how a rototiller spins this way. A rotary plow spins this way, 90 degrees from that. Um, and it also spins much slower. It has the, the effect of pulling up rather than fragmenting quack grass runners. Um, they still break, but uh, far, far, far less than if you were to take a, a, um, a rototiller through it. Unfortunately, that does not control them because, you know, at least half of each one of these things is still underground. And then I take my second favorite tool on the farm, the first one being the three-pronged garden fork. The second one is this, which is called, um, you can find it online, it's called a trash hook or a trash rake or a trash fork. Um, it's, it's, what would, it's what you'd get if you took a, uh, a long-handled uh, pitchfork and bent the tines at 90 degrees. And I take that and, uh, and just rake through the soil. This is, by the way, let's, let's make, make it very clear. This is not a no-till practice. This is a till, a very, very serious till practice. But it's, it's how to control quack grass without um, herbicides. Um, and, uh, and then you pull them all up, and then you, and you just get rid of them. It, it works pretty well. And now what about tarping? Tarping doesn't work very well for quack grass unless you leave it on for half a year. Um, if you leave it on for a few months, those runners will still be uh, ready to reemerge. It will help. It will absolutely help, uh, and it will weaken them, but it will not get rid of them. Um, and uh, cover crops, not so much. If you if you could take a garden out of production, do a, a rye cover crop, you know, rye vetch over winter, tarp that for a couple of months you actually get very, very good quack grass control because there's so much competition and so little light, uh, it pretty much kills it all off. But if you're trying to work within uh, growing beds and you need to get it under control quickly, this way works pretty well. I don't have another good alternative. If you don't have a BCS with a rotary plow, I don't really have another good alternative for you. But that's how I, this is how I do it. And ask me next year whether I think it's quite as good as currently, I think, because I'm not sure whether it is. Happy to take more questions if there are. Does anyone else have any other questions for Richard at this point? I see in the a uh, couple things in the um, in the chat. Um, thoughts on alfalfa meal, soybean meal, or nitrogen? I think I dealt with. I just I buy what's cheap. But if you want, I mean. For for vegan nitrogen supplementing supple, supplementing, you certainly don't want feather meal, and you don't want the the product I was trying to uh, find uh, find the, the name of, which it looks as though Kim Albert has put in uh, Pro Booster the 1000. Uh, thank you. Uh, alfalfa versus soybean. I don't have a I don't have a recommendation or a preference. I, again, I would go for for uh, dollars per pound. Um, and then uh, someone says caution with alfalfa and soy meal will, would be GMO. That's a good point. Now, it should be that if you get it from the NOFA bulk order, it is um, not, uh, it not, GM, not GMO. Um, I'm pretty sure that's a, a fair a guarantee there. Um, somebody says FYY for thistle, for thistle, buckwheat is supposed to help them, and then tarp. Uh, I, luckily, I have not had a thistle problem, and so... I will take that as a tip for me in case I ever do get it. And then Jan says, I have a question about Doc. Yes. Uh, I would love to hear. Yeah, go ahead, I, Jan. Did I hear you say that you just dug it up and it was gone? Because uh, it took us three years to get rid of the Doc that came in on a, on a, on a load of manure from a friend's farm, you know? Oh. No. Don't you hate that? <laughs> I, you yes. know, yeah, no, seriously. I really, We're not even sure I, which and you know, it was, yeah. you know, so. Yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer for you. I, in terms of, of getting rid of it, yeah, once you have a dock plant, I don't think there's anything you can do except dig it up. Um, but does you, it, does it, it may be. Does it spread from the root things? No. Or is it the seeds? So in other words, I had three, the, I bought three years of seeds. Yeah. Um, never go to my. Seed. Uh, yeah, I believe I'm right in saying that Doc does not 
it doesn't send out roots the way that you know quack grass or bindweed or something like that does. Let's but see. it does. Doc will make an enormous, enormous root, and you have to get almost every bit of it out to get rid of the plant. That's the that's the real problem. I take a shovel and I accept the fact that I'm just going to be digging six to eight, ten inches down into the soil to to get it out. You did that with shovels and pitchforks, and it still came back the <laughs> three years, three years. Ago. Yeah. You finally tarped it for yeah. like six months or something. Okay, that's it. You know. You have my sympathies. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, there was another question about, uh, I scroll back up to see it, um, uh, with chopped alfalfa. That's a really good question. Uh, you know, as I say, I have a hay field. Um, if you've got chopped alfalfa, um, by all means, use it. Um, I would, I would, you know, you're going to be left with stems pretty quickly because the leaves are going to turn, you know, right away into uh, into um, soil. Uh, but, but you know, those stems will last a long time. But if you've got that much alfalfa, I would sell it and buy uh, some some nitrogen and then get free leaves because you can sell alfalfa for real money. On the other hand, of course, it's spoiled. You know, on the but the other thing to keep in mind is if it's if it's pure alfalfa, great. But if it's not pure, you know, if it's an alfalfa in a mixed stand, you're going to be bringing in grass seed uh, with it. Um, in your work, timing slides describe spreading, comp spreading compost twice, once in October, once in the spring. I I spread compost whenever I have time to. So I try to spread it all in the fall, and the ones that I miss, I then do in the spring. Do you continue to apply it compost twice a year? No, that I only apply it once a year. Um, and on the on the bed that after I after I've got a good thick layer of compost on it, I'm not applying three inches the next year or three inches the next year. I'm trying to now cut back, especially to you know, half an inch to an inch, because um, it's expensive. There's no question about. It. I mean, it's a good investment. Your your plants are going to be very healthy, but there's no question that it's a, it's an investment. Any thoughts on chopped off comfrey? No, I have none because I've never used it. Uh, I don't know what comfrey's um, if it has any lilopathic qualities, that would be the first thing I'd ask, um, but it might not. Liza G says, do you ever have time for a tour of your farm? Oh, I always have time for t farm tours, but only in the summer um, because in the winter there's not that much to see. Jay Miller says, how aggressive would you be in killing a new garden form of cow pasture? Yeah, wanting to become a forest again against our human wishes. Um, I tell you, I haven't done this in a long time. You know, a long time. I haven't done, you know, probably 10 years. It was the last time I actually tried to put a new garden, new major garden into into production out of the hay field. Um, and my thoughts were very different at that time. So I, uh, if I were doing it now, I think what I'd probably do is take my BCS, do the whole thing, um, uh, tarp the whole thing. For I, I tried to do it the year before I wanted to. I wanted to plant in it. I I told the whole thing. I tried to tarp the whole thing for a couple of months during the summer, <clears throat> which will also get rid of a lot of your perennial weeds. Uh oh, I don't know what that was. Um, somebody's mic might be on, so you might. I'm getting an echo here. I don't know why. Anyway, uh, I would, um, you know, I'd, I would for sure start the year before, till the whole thing, tarp the whole thing. If you can put down your stuff, that's great, and then tarp the whole thing. That'll make a really, really sweet bed. Um, but you're still going to have to watch it uh, because, I, you know, I think soil takes a couple of years really to sort of become uh, mellow and predictable. Um, anyway, there you go. Red clover and buckwheat have been good cover crops in my models plus. I, I find that uh, you know important information. I I've tried buckwheat. I really recommend buckwheat if you want to feed your pollinators. Just plant buckwheat. Don't ever till it in. Just plant buckwheat. It just makes the most amazing uh, stuff for for bringing in things you never knew you were around. As far as a as far as a cover crop goes, I I. Believe when people say that it's good for suppressing weeds. I've never found much benefit to buckwheat, but I still have a lot to learn. Um, this has been really fun. It looks like it's it's just about time for us to go, and I'm, I'm actually about to go host another section, so I'm going to have to go as well. 
Um, thank you guys so much. Um, if you uh, if you want to get in touch, uh, farm at hopesville dot com. And um, uh, back to you, Christine. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know we all learned a ton from you during this workshop, and um, thank you so much for for everything you shared with us. Um, and, I've, and everyone in the audience, thank you also for for bearing with us during our Zoom audio difficulties. I'm glad we were able to get those improved and worked out. Um, I also wanted to to just reiterate what I said earlier about the the soil tech no till calls. It's a really great opportunity for anyone exploring minimum tillage or no tillage, or even just wanting to learn more or share share some of their own experiences to join the informal discussion. Um, and again, you can email us at soilhealth at nofamass.org. And um, we can add you to the, the email list. You can also check out our events page on our NOFMS website, and that has information about the tills on there as well. Um, as well as we also have regular soil health related field days where we talk about no-till and minimum till practices, which is, is a great opportunity for anyone kind of exploring the transition. I have a few additional transit or announcements, um, and Paul will be dropping the links into the chat for them. Um, we would like for you to please fill out an evaluation. It's a perfect time to give us feedback about the session and Richard's wonderful workshop. Um, Paul, I think, put the, the link in earlier and he might put it in again. We also have our vendor marketplace, which is your opportunity to visit um, the information about our vendors and find generous discount codes and valuable information from the people who've helped make this um, conference possible. We also have our auction going on with some incredible items to bid on. Visit the auction website or text NOFA at 855-202-2100 to see the lineup. Our auction items include access to the Soil Food Web School Foundation courses, a pallet of organic soil delivered from Maine, coast of Maine, seed company gift cards, oysters, cheese, books, and so much more. The auction proceeds support our year-round programming and advocacy work, including all of our soil health work. So if you're able to, please je bid generously. Also, if you are joining the session as part of Continuing Ed, um, your attendance fulfills one and a half continuing education credits. Um, please keep a record of your attendance to submit to Connecticut NOFA by January 1st, 2023. And finally, we still have a lot going on. We have an upcoming session that starts at four o'clock as well as sessions all day tomorrow. Um, all sessions are listed in the program book and recordings will be available to attendees via our YouTube playlist by Monday, January 24th. So again, thank you everyone for um, joining this workshop and Richard, thank you so much for, for all your wonderful knowledge that you shared. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good afternoon, everyone.